for a discussion. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and uh, I'm glad to see a number of my, my, my people are also here. <laughs> so uh, I welcome all of you. Uh, I had hoped to make this a more conversational kind of thing in where uh, it's not just me talking but uh, that you, you are welcome to interact in between if you have any queries and certainly at the end of the discussion I'd be very happy to take questions. I was initially a little perplexed when uh, Dr. Rana told me that I should be 75 minutes of talking, so I said that would be a little too much. Yeah. He didn't consult with me before uh, giving you that guidance. So I thought that would be a little too much of infliction. So, uh, but it's great being here and um, I also share a lot of common friends with uh, your this water. And um, I am happy that uh, it's, a, it's a good opportunity to be able to talk about a program which I think has a lot of misunderstandings and misgivings in the international arena. So let me begin by saying that uh, more than 2,500 years ago, there was an Indian sage called Kanara who uh, elucidated the word atom. So, uh, flash forward another 2,500 years and in 1944, which is just three years after Fermi had uh, done the pile in Chicago, uh, an Indian, Homi Baba, set up uh, the first nuclear research center in uh, uh, what became the Tata Institute of Fundamental Research in Mumbai, Bombay at that time. And uh, in 1946, that's even before independence, uh, an atomic an atomic research committee was set up by the uh, interim government. And in 1948, barely a year after we got independent, uh, the Atomic Energy uh, Commission was uh, established. So uh, all this is to preface the point that we were in many ways early adapters, early beginners in the nuclear field. It's not something we came to much later. And while conscious of the risks posed by nuclear weapons, we always saw the opportunity of the peaceful uses of nuclear energy for power generation, in medicine, in industry and in agriculture. And uh, the newly independent India faced huge developmental challenges. We had barely a thousand plus megawatts at that time of power. And uh, we needed to develop in a big way. But uh, we saw nuclear power as the most cost effective base load electricity that we could have, and of course, which is also benign in a sense, and which is also non polluting in, its, in a sense. Uh, and uh, when the IAEA was established in 1957, we were among the original founding members and we have been a member of the governing board of the IEA ever since. <clears throat> so early in the program, uh, India decided that uh, the only way to go ahead would be to acquire capabilities in all areas of the fuel cycle, starting with prospecting for the ores, to uh, mining for them, fuel fabrication, and then of course heavy water plants because we were, I will explain later why we need heavy water plants. Then power and research reactors, reprocessing and waste management. So we also decided that uh, we would make our research reactors to produce isotopes for medicine industry and agriculture beginning in 1955 with Asia's first nuclear reactor Apsara. And in 1960 the General Electric commenced, commenced construction of India's first nuclear power plant in, at Tarapur. This was two 150 megawatt boiling water reactors which were fueled by enriched uranium. But we recognized that uh, this would not be the route that would take us to our glory in nuclear area because uh, we didn't uh, have, uh, we had very limited uh, domestic uranium resources. And we also uh, had uh, very virtually not, no uh, enrichment facilities at that time. So we decided that the better route would be to go from natural uranium 
which we had some but not too much uh, and uh, move in that direction and that is why we adopted the Canadian model which is uh, the pressurized heavy water reactor where you use natural uranium heavy water moderator and uh, you they, thereby generate power and this Canadian model was called CANDO <laughs> not T-O but T-E-C-A-N-D-U Canada, Canada Deuterium Uranium so uh, this uh, and then because we had to use heavy water we also set up a series of heavy water plants across India and uh, but in, in uh, even though we had very limited uranium available with us, uh, India does have 25% of the world's thorium reserves, known reserve deposits of thorium in the monazite sands in Kerala. We therefore decided to adopt a three-stage program, PHWRs, pressurized heavy water reactors to generate power and produce plutonium in the first stage, fast breeder reactors to use this plutonium mixed with uranium oxide and uh, then the plutonium undergoes fission to produce energy while the U238 or natural uranium <coughs> transmutes to additional uh, plutonium and this is why it's called a breeder reactor so you produce more fuel than you consume. Once the inventory of plutonium is built up then we move, we are planning to move to the third stage uh, in which thorium can be introduced as a blanket and the transmuted U233 uh, is used for generating power at the third stage. So this was the grand plan, which interestingly uh, was set in course uh, by Baba himself, the founder of our program in, 19, in the 50s. Uh, in 1954, just weeks after the Castle Bravo nuclear test, Prime Minister Nehru made his first call for a standstill agreement on nuclear testing. India became part of the 18-nation committee on disarmament in 1961, which focused on disarmament, confidence building measures and nuclear test controls. We also became party to the test ban treaty, the partial test ban treaty of 1963, which called for a termination of nuclear tests in the atmosphere, in the water and underwater and in outer space. By 1965, however, we realized that the ENCD, the 18 Nation Committee on Disarmament, had transmuted into negotiating the NPT, Non-Proliferation Treaty, which essentially sought to segregate the haves from the have-nots. So India is consequently not a party to this discriminatory treaty. The 1962 China-India war was a very, very traumatic experience for us. And China exploded its first nuclear weapon in 1964. We were left with a very formidable nuclear armed neighbor who continues illegal occupation of 38,000 kilometers, square kilometers of Indian territory and uh, demands and lays claim to a further 90,000 square kilometers, which is under Indian control. The Chinese nuclear test raised India's determination to test a nuclear weapon. But then followed the Indo-Pak War of 1965, severe economic crisis in the years 66 to 69, and the 1971 Indo-Pak War, which led to the liberation of Bangladesh. And all this delayed our testing, and finally we did manage to test in May 1974. After the peaceful nuclear explosion of 1974, Canada withdrew nuclear cooperation from India with, with India, forcing us to indigenize. So the Kando became Indo, India Deuterium Uranium. Strong reaction by the West saw the setting up of the Zander Committee, the London Club, and then that eventually became the Nuclear Suppliers Group. In the face of embargo regimes, we had only one option. We achieved, wanted to achieve self-reliance and therefore built up our own capabilities in the nuclear energy sector. We continued construction of nuclear power plants uh, in Rajasthan, Madras, Narora, Kakrapar and Kaiga. We successfully negotiated for two Russian VVER 1000 megawatt reactors light water reactors which are operating in Kudankulam in Tamil Nadu and we also negotiated with various people including Russia for fuel for the Tarapur 
plant which was originally set up by General Electric because the US denied fuel supply. And uh, then we also moved on to the fast breeder program. First we had the FBTR, the fast breeder test reactor, which uh, actually went online in the 80s and uh, we were able to show that it worked. And today I am happy to say that the fast breeder prototype of 500 megawatts is nearing completion. We are hoping that this year it will go online. And uh, it's interesting that uh, Kalpakam in near Madras, Chennai, is uh, perhaps the only facility in the world which operates all three types of reactors simultaneously. We have PHWRs with uh, natural uranium, we have fast breeder reactors, and we also have the Kamini, which is the one I told you in the third stage, where you are trying to see how to use U233 to generate power. Uh, the Kamini is of course just a small experimental reactor and the idea is that seeing our, our experience by operating Kamini, we will then eventually when we move to the third stage have a full blown program in terms of the third phase. So in the international fora, India continued to press for the complete elimination of nuclear weapons. In 1988, Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi proposed an action plan for a nuclear weapons free and non-violent world order to attain the goal of nuclear disarmament in a time-bound, universal, non-discriminatory, phased and verifiable manner. We remain committed to this plan and the realization of a vision ushering in a nuclear weapon-free world and non-violent order. It was in this spirit that we entered into negotiations for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty, the CTBT, in January 1994. However, India could not go along with the consensus on the draft text and its transmittal to the UNGA because we had strong misgivings about the provisions for entry into force of the treaty, which was unprecedented in multilateral practice and running contrary to customary international law. The failure of the treaty to include a commitment by nuclear weapon states to eliminate nuclear weapons within a time-bound framework appeared to us another attempt by the nuclear haves to maintain a separate status for themselves. Furthermore, the intention to continue testing of nuclear weapons by subcritical and other techniques was a violation of the spirit of the treaty. Added to this was the indefinite extension of the NPT in 1995, which clearly demonstrated the intention of the nuclear weapon states to continue manufacture, stockpiling and testing of nuclear weapons indefinitely. It became clear to us that the window of opportunity for further nuclear testing by us was closing. We therefore chose to conduct five underground nuclear tests in May 1998. We subscribed to a policy of credible minimum deterrent and espoused a policy of no first use and non-use against non-nuclear weapon states. We are committed to maintaining a unilateral and voluntary moratorium on nuclear explosive testing and to working with the international community to advance our common objectives of non-proliferation through export, strong export controls and multilateral export control regimes. Both uh, the US and India saw the logic in engaging in dialogue to resolve the tensions following these tests. They, and they saw that it was made much more sense to dialogue than to vote for uh, sanctions or bans or anything of that kind. And uh, they realized that uh, conversation between the two largest democracies may produce more results. So from June 1998, that's just one month after the tests by us, to September 2000, U.S. Deputy Secretary of State Strobe Talbot and Indian External Affairs Minister Jaswan Singh met 14 times in seven countries and three continents to discuss the immediate terms on the security and nuclear proliferation, non-proliferation agenda, as well as the, their, wider, their wider visions for the US-India relationship and the potential for economic and strategic cooperation between US and India. The Talbot Singh diplomacy laid the groundwork for the transformational visit of President Bill Clinton to India in March 2000 and helped end 35 years of estrangement between the United States and India. Shared concerns of terrorism and mutual interests deepened. 
the relationship and laid the base for negotiations for the India-US Nuclear Cooperation Agreement in the India-US Joint Statement of July 2005. This agreement and the subsequent endorsement of India's case by the Nuclear Suppliers Group enabled India to engage in international nuclear trade. In return, New Delhi agreed to allow safeguards on a select number of its nuclear facilities that are classified as civilian in purpose. The remaining military facilities remain off limits to international inspectors. The US Congress passed the Hyde Act in January 2006 to exempt nuclear cooperation with India from provisions of the US Atomic Energy Act, allowing for the adoption of the bilateral 123 nuclear cooperation agreement in August 2007. In September 2008, the NSG approved an exemption allowing its members to conduct nuclear trade with India. Finally, a safeguards agreement for select civilian nuclear facilities was conducted between India and the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, in February 2009, after approval by the IAEA Board of Governors. India also concluded a model additional protocol with the IAEA, as sought by the US and NSG, which came into force in 2014. In October 2009, India submitted a separation plan to put 14 civilian nuclear facilities under IAEA safeguards by 2014. This has been implemented. In late July 2010, India and the United States signed a bilateral agreement allowing India to reprocess US obligated nuclear material at two new reprocessing facilities to be constructed and placed under IAEA safeguards. Following the NSG waiver, India continues to participate in nuclear inter international nuclear trade. India signed uh, co nuclear cooperation agreements with Russia, France, United Kingdom, South Korea, Canada, Argentina, Kazakhstan, Mongolia, and Namibia. In October 2009, New Delhi identified two locations in the states of Gujarat and Andhra Pradesh that could host reactors constructed by GE, Hitachi, and Westinghouse. India's liability laws regulating civil nuclear plants, however, posed a hurdle to international firms interested in projects in India, but India has taken measures to address civilian uh, the concerns of investors, including by ratifying the Convention on Supplementary Compensation for Nuclear Damage in 2016. The same year, the United States and India agreed to move forward on negotiations for Westinghouse to, conduct, to construct six nuclear reactors. Our reason for seeking nuclear cooperation was based on our need to overcome the growing energy deficit that confronted us, particularly in a scenario where we sought to raise our annual GDP growth from 8% to over 10%. We saw access to nuclear technology as providing a plentiful and non-polluting source of power to meet our energy needs. However, to increase the share of nuclear power in our energy mix, we required to break out of the confines imposed by inadequate reserves of uranium and the international embargoes that constrained our nuclear program for over three decades. So, As of now, uh, we have 22 nuclear reactors, which are uh, <coughs> we we have 22 nuclear reactors which are in operation today. Uh, 18 of them are pressurized heavy water reactors, and the present generation capacity is 6,780 megawatts. Seven reactors with installed capacity of 5,300 megawatts are under construction. 43 reactors with 41,200 megawatts are planned to be operational by 2050. Apart from pressurized heavy water reactors, a significant component is the number of light water reactors, US, French, Russian, Japanese, that are planned. The uranium in the first stage pressurized heavy water reactors that yield energy in a once-through cycle 
can be made to yield 65 to 128 times more energy through multiple cycles in fast breeder reactors. This is the reason we want to go in for the three-stage system. Once through five cycles, which are now standard in the nuclear power industry in the West, are inherently wasteful because of low burn-up. There is significantly larger potential to generate much larger amounts of energy through reprocessing and the use of fast breeder reactors. Our first, as I mentioned earlier, our first 500 megawatt FBR is coming online this year. And we are planning to construct four more FBRs totaling 2,500 megawatts from five FBR reactors, FBRs. Now, another scientific fact is that uh, I told you about the first phase and the second phase. After you finish the FBR stage, you can't immediately jump to the third phase because you need to build up a quantity of fissile fuel. And this is called doubling time. So this doubling time of doubling the fuel in the reactor fed it to the FBRs, this is widely uh, speculated. In a, people are not really sure how long it takes. We estimate it may take as much as 30 years to actually operate the FBRs adequate time in order to have enough fuel to, to get into the third stage where with a thorium blanket we are producing U233. So meanwhile we decided we also need parallel approaches for more direct use of the thorium which we have. So we have accelerator driven systems which are being employed. We have the advanced heavy water reactor using thorium, the compact high temperature reactor and molten salt reactor. As part of our interest in fusion research and its prospects in the long term, India is also a member of the International Thermonuclear Energy Research Exper Experimental Reactor. So this is of course in Cadarache in France. So I just want to, this was by way of giving both people who are aficionados or experts and also those who may not be okay with the program a kind of a blend of what we are doing and uh, how we uh, have addressed concerns regarding uh, the issue of elimination of weapons also. We have in place export controls which are as strict or even stricter than those in the United States and elsewhere. We see mem India's membership of the four export control regimes, the NSG, the MTCR, the Vasanar Arrangement and Australia Group as mutually beneficial taking into account common non-proliferation objectives, global industry linkages and the contributions that Indian industry can make with its expanding capabilities to the global economy. India became a member of MTCR in June 2016, the Vasanar Arrangement in December 2017 and the Australia Group in January 2018, leaving the NSG as the last one we hope to enter we do face opposition from China. India's impeccable non-proliferation record and our responsible behavior as a nuclear state for more than three decades should continue to guide the expedited easing of export control restrictions. In today's global supply chain of multiple vendors, this would also be in the interests of the US industry. India has held a consistent position on fissile material cutoff and envisages it as a significant contribution to nuclear non-proliferation in all its aspects. We have encouraged the negotiation and early conclusion of a multilateral, universally applicable and effectively verifiable treaty on FMCT at the Conference on Disarmament. India is one of the countries taking the lead in raising international awareness of the dangers inherent in the possible link between the weapons of mass destruction and international terrorism. The possible acquisition through clandestine means of nuclear weapons or other WMDs by non-state actors adds an entirely new dimension to the nuclear threat, a threat which cannot be deterred by the doctrines of retaliatory use. In fact, the dangers of nuclear terrorism are another reason to seek the early elimination of nuclear weapons. For as long as there is a world divided between nuclear weapon haves and have-nots, there will always be the danger of proliferation to additional countries. This is what gives rise to the clandestine network of the kind run from Pakistan, 
which creates potential sources of supplies for terrorist or jihadi groups. The greatest likelihood of such a threat emanates from our neighborhood. We are glad that the USA shares this view and is willing to confront it with a sense of urgency. India has been consistent in our support for global elimination of all weapons of mass destruction. Mahatma Gandhi was moved by the tragedy of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but remained unshaken in his belief in nonviolence. He wrote that he regarded the employment of the atom bomb for the wholesale destruction of men, women and children as the most diabolical use of science. Seven decades later, it remains our collective challenge to craft a nuclear weapon-free and non-violent world order. India believes that the goal of nuclear disarmament can be achieved through a step-by-step -step process, underwritten by universal commitment and an agreed multilateral framework that is global and non-discriminatory. There is need for a meaningful dialogue among all states possessing nuclear weapons to build trust and confidence and for reducing the salience of nuclear weapons paving the way for their eventual complete elimination. In 1967, it was an era of judgment to view India as too inconsequential to the shaping of the nuclear order. In 2017, it would be a double error to consider India as not consequential enough as a nuclear non-proliferation partner for the management of this order. Fortunately, Countries subscribing to this erroneous view are but a small, sullen and shrinking minority. India remains steadfast in its support for global disarmament and non-proliferation objectives, the disarmament machinery and the role of dialogue and negotiation in reaching multilateral outcomes that enhance national and global security. We may have a mind of our own matched by a firm and consistent national policy, but we are prepared to embrace collective solutions for the larger common good. As mankind confronts the challenges of climate change and inclusive growth, nuclear energy will continue to play an important role in our lives. India and many other nations have built their developmental strategies on this premise. In fact, it is our expectation of predictable and affordable access to civilian nuclear energy that is the basis for our commitments under the Paris Agreement for 40% non-fossil power generation capacity. On the other hand, the negative consequences of atomic power can also not be ignored. The world has witnessed the immense destructive power of the atom. We hope that such horrors will never be repeated and cannot overstate the importance of countries with nuclear weapons to be responsible. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <laughs>